And welcome once again to another episode of Stiegler for the Details. My name is Alan Dickerson, known in some war game circles as Stiegler. And we're going to be continuing our uh, tutorials on the classic S. Craig Taylor title, Flat Top. And in this episode, we are going to tackle surface combat and also uh, bombardment, which is a offshoot of that that is directed against bases. So let's uh, just get right into it. So what we're going to do today is use as an example uh, the first battle fought off of Savo Island. And Savo Island is right here. Uh, this little black rock here to the northwest of uh, Guadalcanal and Henderson Field, and it figured uh, prominently in the battle for Guadalcanal early on. So just to set the scene, we're going to assume that it is nighttime, and the Japanese task force right here has sailed down the slot here. Here's the slot. Sailed down the slot and is hoping to force a night action against the Americans. And the Americans have posted a fleet here um, to both sides of Savo Island. And they have some uh, radar equipped destroyers that they were using as a picket, but what they did not know was that the landmass of uh, Guadalcanal, uh, as well as Savo Island, uh, greatly degraded the quality of those very rudimentary ship radars, so they did not detect the Japanese coming. So we're going to use this as an example of... Um, surface combat, and then we'll go in and talk about um, how battleships and uh, other ships can shell bases. All right. So what happens uh, during the normal course of play is that during the task force movement, um, ships can do searches after they move. And if it is determined then that enemy forces are in the same hex, then either side um, can declare combat, surface combat in that hex, and the other side can't do anything about it. They have to accept it. So let's assume then that the American task force is just waiting here. And let me retire to the Japanese side so that I can move their counters. Let's assume that the Japanese move in here and uh, conduct a search whereby they determine uh, that the Americans are there. Now, keep in mind that at night, a task force can search for another task force Force, and if they are in the same hex, range zero, the observation value is one, is that there is something there. And that is all that is needed to be able to, to declare combat. So the Japanese uh, move in and, you know, uh, make their task force visible by way of declaring that they are conducting a search. The Americans have to also declare that something is there. And we move then to the combat phase. Now, this is the way it works. Surface combat is conducted here on the surface combat board. Each side takes um, takes the forces that they have in all of the task forces that are in that hex, if there are multiple ones. And they have to 
place them in one of three areas. The torpedo area, the bombardment area, and the screen area. Now, the torpedo area is the area where the ships that are in that compartment will conduct the second round of combat after the bombardment is done. They will get to use uh, their torpedo factors, but only if in the daytime the combined BHT, and I'll get to how that is determined, the combined BHT in the daytime is 10 or greater, or at night it is 7 or greater. We'll get back to the BHT later. The ships that are in the bombardment area will be able to conduct bombardment against other enemy ships that are in their bombardment area here. And ships that are placed in screen are the ships that you don't want to be targeted or to um, take part in the combat. So those are screened. and. Um, they are not eligible for the bombardment round. We'll get to how they can become targets or targeted um, as we explain this. Okay, so let's assume here that the Japanese are entering this combat round with um, five heavy cruisers, two, those are the CA ones here, two light cruisers, and one destroyer. The Americans are weighing in with three heavy or two heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and two destroyers. Now, The Japanese um, are trying to maximize their advantages during night combat. And their advantage in night, or in really in any kind of combat of this nature, is that they have uh, a better torpedo capability. Let me show you what I mean. Here on the ammo expenditure table, we have the same ships here, and we see what their ammo factor is and what their torpedo factor is. Most ships have a one torpedo factor, but these two cruiser lights have two. If we look at the American counterparts, whoops, actually, I don't want to look at that. I want to look at their ammo i can't hang on a second I'm working with the vassal module you your access can be limited by the side that you have so i have to retire and sign in as the u.s navy and now i can see the u.s a ammo chart and this is what the Americans have in this battle. These are other ships in another task force that is not present here. They have, for the heavy cruisers, no torpedo values. For the destroyers, one each. So they are disadvantaged in the realm of torpedoes. Now, The other thing to keep in mind is during a torpedo combat, if it occurs, and we'll get into those gating factors in a second, if it comes down to that and there is a torpedo combat round, the Japanese 
conduct whatever the torpedo combat is from the basic hit table of 15 here, the Americans do torpedo combat on 10. So you can see as the factors grow, the number of hits really grows in the Japanese favor. So that's what they're going to try to maximize. And that is going to factor heavily into where the Japanese are going to place their forces. Now, once combat is declared, both sides first um, secretly determine what their BHT value is. And the two are revealed simultaneously, and then they are combined to do two things. One, they determine whether there will be combat action or torpedo action or not. For night, it has to be a combined BHT of seven. During the daytime, it has to be a combined BHT of 10 or more. If, okay, so the Americans know that they are kind of disadvantaged here. And so let's say they will assume their basic hit table will only be one. They want the BHT to be as low as possible to minimize the number of hits that are scored by anybody. The Japanese know that they have this torpedo advantage, and so they want to get the BHT to at least seven, which is the minimum for a night turn. So as a as a uh, result of that, they want to let me I think I have to retire again, go back to Japan, and they want to ratchet their BHT up to six because they know that the Americans can only have a minimum of one and six and one will create the seven BHT that is necessary to create a torpedo combat round. So they pick a BHT of six, the Americans pick a BHT of one and hope that the Japanese pick a lower BHT. And then simultaneously, both sides uh, make their counter visible. So basically, this is based on supposedly a a die, you know, the cube, the dice that you basically, you know, set under a cup or something. You both do it and then you reveal at the same time. So the BHT is revealed. Then both sides can uh, bring in their forces and place them um, in each of these areas as they see fit. So they would bring those in from their task force, um, their task force display. So let's say that the Japanese will bring in their two light cruisers and their destroyer and place those in the torpedo area. They will bring in the five heavy cruisers in the bombardment area, and they won't leave anything in the screen because they're on the attack. They have nothing really to defend. Then the U.S. player, now I'm going to have to retire again and join the U.S. Navy. Okay. The U.S. Navy will decide um, that they have a gunnery advantage here. The first number for their heavy cruisers is four. So they know that they have somewhat of an advantage here, and they will 
place all of their ships in the bombardment area. Nothing in the screen. Now, the screen would be if, say, if you had a uh, a carrier in your task force, that would be a great ship to place in the screen because you don't want your carrier taking any hits. Carriers only have a one gunnery factor. So, you know, they're they're not very powerful. Their power obviously is in their ships. So you would probably put any carrier in your screen. Also, your uh, if you have any transports carrying troops, they would be placed in the screen there too. Now, so this determination would be done simultaneously and secretly and also revealed secondarily. Now, what happens is that there is a bombardment round of combat. Then if the BHT is high enough, there's a torpedo round of combat. Or wait, no, let me let me take that back. Okay. You start off with a bombardment round. And this is where you total up the gunnery factors of all of the ships that you have in your bombardment side. So for the Japanese, we have 5, 8, 11, 14, 17. For the US, we have 4, 8, 10, 11, 12. 17 to 12. You total up all of those, and then you can uh, dole them out and determine how many of those factors are going to be targeted at other ships, enemy ships that are also in their bombardment area. You do that, then you conduct a round of combat, which I will undergo. And then after that, if any ships are sunk, obviously they're removed from combat. You then total up the gunnery factors for both sides. And if it's determined then that one side or the other has a three to one ratio or three to one advantage in gunnery factors over the enemy, then the enemy can uh, do a additional bombardment round that can target ships that are in the screen of the disadvantaged enemy. So in other words, if you had a carrier hiding back there and your cruisers do a good enough job in the bombardment round, you can declare breakthrough combat and then go in and target the carrier. Okay. Then after that is done, if the the combined BHT is high enough, then you do a torpedo round of combat. So the Japanese know that because the total BHT is seven, that they're going to be able to um, direct torpedoes at these cruisers. Okay. So with that in mind, let's go through the combat and see how this would happen. Each of these rounds are conducted simultaneously. And then you determine how many hits are doled out and then um, the effects of that if any, any ships are sunk. So let's uh, break out the... Hang on a sec. Let's break out the dice here and break out the tables and see how this would go for our Battle of Savo Island. So we'll start with the Japanese since they're initiating everything. We said they had 17, was it? Um, 5, 8, 11, 14. Yeah, 17 factors of gunnery. So they are going to... Uh, 17 factors. They are going to direct 10 factors at Quincy 
and 10 factors at Vincennes, or seven. So 10 at Quincy, seven at Vincennes. The basic hit table is the combined declaration of the players, which is seven. So moving on to the charts, our basic hit table is seven. So for the 10 factors, that generates two hits. For seven, that also generates two hits. So let's see if maybe if the Japanese play with their math a little bit and do an 11 and a six. Now, if they do an 11 and a six, that will generate a base of three hits and a base of one. So probably the best thing to do is to go with a base of two against both of those targets and hope that their die, die rolling will uh, worsen those attacks. Okay. So we have a basic hit of two on both of the Japanese targets. So let's start uh, against the Quincy and then the Vincennes. So we have a basic result of two. And then, of course, we roll the die to see what happens um, with that. And this is the same as um, airstrike combat. So against the Quincy, we roll a five. A roll of five gives you an additional hit. So the Quincy takes three hits. Then against the Vincennes, we roll a die and we get a four. That means the um, the basic result is unmodified. So that'll be two. And then you roll for a critical hit. Five does not get a critical hit. So let's see. Not set up. We want. Um, okay, so we have the Quincy has taken three hits, and we'll clone that and decrease it. Three hits versus two hits. So um, three hits is more than half of the hits that Quincy can sustain, which is five, the number here in the top right. So her movement is going to be halved. So we'll move that in there. The Vincennes is at two, and she needs three hits to render her movement half. So that's the result of the Japanese combat. Now, the Americans have 12 factors. And also, by way of explanation, we don't have any battleships. Those are the big heavy hitters. We don't have any battleships present in this battle. But if there were only ships that are of heavy cruiser or uh, converted carrier, CAV, or other battleships can target enemy battleships. So cruiser lights, destroyers, other little small ships cannot lend their... Uh, their gunnery factor to target battleships. Battleships basically can target anything they want. They're the big dogs, but they cannot be targeted by the lower quality ships. Okay, that is not in play here. So we have four, eight, 10, 11, 12 total factors for the Americans. And based on a BHT of seven, if they combine all 12 against one target, they have a base of three. If they do six towards two targets, unfortunately, they'll only get one. So their best bet is to use seven of the 12 to generate a base of two and then have five left over to generate um one 
or they can put all their eggs in one basket and go for three hits against one of these heavy cruisers. So actually they think that, yeah, that's that's the best thing to do is to send all 12 factors and generate three hits against the Chokai, which is the flagship of the Japanese. So that's what they're going to do. So we're going to assume three hits, and we roll the die, and we get a one, which unfortunately reduces the result by two hits. So the three hits turns into... Let's clone that. Just one hit against the Chokai. So the Japanese plan seems to be working very, very well. That's the bombardment round. Now, if there were uh, American ships in the screen, like some transports or, or a carrier or something like that, this is the point where we would total up um, the number of factors that are left to see if it results in a three to one advantage. Now, for damage, we know that hits on a ship reduce the ship's gunnery factor by one. So this is going to affect our calculus here. Quincy is reduced to one gunnery factor. Vincennes is reduced to two gunnery factors. So that's three, four, five, six, seven. Seven total U.S. gunnery factors versus... Four for the Jokai now, four, seven, 10, 13, 16. 16, so that would mean they would need to have reduced the US to five to get the breakthrough round. I don't think they've done that. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, so they would not get a breakthrough round. So, the next thing is the torpedo round. The Japanese are now going to get to uh, use their torpedo factors against the ships here. Now, let us look at the Japanese torpedo factors. They have five here in their torpedo line that they can dole out and let's find our tables here. Their BHT for Japanese torpedoes is 15. So with five factors, they can start with a base of three here, or they could use four from the two light carriers and create two hits on one target, use the one from the destroyer and generate one hit. Oh, excuse me, I've got a phone call. I've got to check and see what's going on here. I'll be right back. All right, we're back. Sorry about that. So let's see here. We've got, um, I think the Japanese are going to, um, hmm.
they're going to split and put uh, a two on one target and a one on the other. And let's see, they're going to put two hits on Quincy to sink her and one on the Vincennes. Okay, so let's go and see what happens with that. So we have two hits on Quincy. We roll the die. We get a three. That doesn't change the result. Is there a critical hit? No, but that's two hits. Quincy is going to be sunk. We have one hit against Vincennes here, and we roll and we get a three. That does not change the result, and we do not get a critical hit. So Vincennes now has three hits. She'll be at half steam, and we go to our point track and we place Quincy in there with five hits. Now, that's going to generate good point total there for the Japanese. Now, the other thing that happens is that ammunition is expended. And I'll show you how that works. Each ship on their ammo starts with a specific ammo value, and they also start with a, a specific uh, torpedo value, as we can see here. For all the ships that uh, take part in combat, they reduce their ammo by that combined BHT, which we determined earlier was seven for this combat round. So all of these, uh, let's see, uh, Quincy was sunk, so we don't have to worry about her anymore. Uh, Vincennes took part, and so her value will be decreased by seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Destroyers only get one ammo. So they they uh, shoot their they shoot their ammunition load in one combat. Now the American um, destroyers we're not in the torpedo line, so they still retain their torpedo factor. The Japanese, however, let's see, they had both their cruiser lights in the torpedo line. And first, let me go back to the Japanese side. All ships that are in the torpedo line use their entire torpedo factor all at once. So it's a use it or lose it. And also, if they commit to the torpedo line and then the combined BHT is not enough to generate torpedo combat, they still use their torpedo factor. So, the two cruiser lights and the destroyer, whoops, use their torpedoes, don't use their ammo factor. But these, all these ships here, the other five, use the combined seven. So they're down to five. And that concludes the ship combat for this turn. So now all of these uh, remaining ships would be sent. Let's see. Sent back to their task forces. 
along with uh, their newly acquired damage for the next turn. That's the Japanese. Then the Americans got to retire again, join the U.S. Navy, and theirs would... <clears throat> Oh, no wonder. I'm trying to move the wrong units. Here we are. They could move back here. The other thing that you can do is just keep separate tracks, and you can always drag uh, additional um instances of these counters you can't clone them here oh yes you can clone them when you own them yes so you can use that and keep a copy of it on the ammo record if you want okay so that's how ship to ship surface combat is conducted now Ships, uh, battleships mostly, and also cruisers, can bombard bases, such as Henderson here. So let us um, go back to the Japanese side, and let's assume that the Japanese show up in the middle of the night, as they did a few times with the Tokyo Express, and there's a big battleship um in there and they want to shell Henderson Field and knock it out of commission. Let's, uh, for the sake of this, assume that we're going to have the Hei. Let's see. Here. Shell Henderson. After the task force moves in and um, actually they, they don't have to declare their presence until it's the combat phase. And then, of course, uh, they would have to uh, declare that they were there and let the Americans know that they're shelling the airfield. There is a round of combat conducted, and the base will have a surface value that is determined by the scenario. So I'm going to refer to the Guadalcanal scenario here and see what we have here. Oh. Wait, no, that wouldn't be there. It would be on the Allied Task Force display. No, not that task force. Um, okay, I've got to switch sides again. Go to the USA and US Navy Task Force. Not task force, it's the AF and find Guadalcanal Henderson. And here we have a SF for Guadalcanal Henderson Field has a surface value of only one. I think maybe in some later ones, they might have a, a higher surface value. That's really, really low. For instance, uh, in Midway, if you were playing that scenario, the Midway had a surface um, value of eight. So 
Well, it's a different period in the war, and Guadalcanal only has a piddling one surface value. Now, keep in mind, they have a AAF, or an air value of 10, uh, a ready of 8, and a launch value of uh, 12, 12 slash 6. So any hits that the Japanese get are going to wreak havoc with that. Now, let's uh, let's give Henderson a shot first. And surface combat is done, or bombardment is done with a BHT of eight. So a one value for the Americans generates a zero result. So that means no hits. You're going to have to rely on your die to increase it. We roll and we get a two, which would reduce it to a negative one, so no hits. The Japanese with Hei have a bombardment value of 12. and 12 with a BHT of 8 gets us 3 hits, and then we roll, and we get a 5, and that, in, that increases the damage to 4. And that result is going to pile 4 hits on Henderson Field. Now, if there were any uh, aircraft that were on the tarmacs at the time, then the the losses would be would be doubled, I believe. Uh, let me check. I don't think the hits from bombardment are doubled. Uh, let's see, hits on bases. Okay. 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 If a base has any plane units in the ready box or just landed, when it receives hits from dive bombing or level bombing, those hits are doubled. So bombardment does not double hits the same way it does if you uh, strike a carrier. So the result then of the four hits on Guadalcanal here are that the launch factor is um, reduced at a two slash one ratio, I believe. Let me check damage once again to make sure I'm telling you the right thing. Yes. The base's AA is reduced by one for every hit. So her AAF will be reduced to six. The launch factor would be a uh, would be reduced to four slash two, the ready factor would be reduced to from eight to four. So that's a one for one ratio. So that's a, a good bit of damage there that's probably going to uh, affect her or Henderson in the morning. But another thing with uh, Henderson is that during day turns, they can uh, repair damage at a rate of two damage points per turn. So that'll quickly be made good. Uh, in the turn that damage is sustained, however, you do not get a repair. Um, 
you do not get a, a repair round. So those are going to be the effects on Henderson. So that, in a nutshell, is how surface combat and bombardments are conducted in flat top. And we're right at about 45 minutes. That's about about right for a uh, for an installment here. And so that will do it for this episode of Stigler for the details. And we will see you next time with uh, another facet of flat top. Or if we have exhausted them all, then perhaps we will um try to string them all together um and follow the the uh sequence of play so that you can kind of see how turns go and how the game flows and we'll do that in our next installment and we'll see you next time